I'd lain back on the sun lounger after taking a quick swig of the big iced cocktail the waiter had just delivered, and I had just turned my attention back to all that nubile, near-naked, young flesh, clad as it mostly was in almost non-existent bikinis, when I spotted her emerging from the water like Aphrodite had from the sea in Greek legend. Or should I say, that I noticed the little black bikini, it's hard to say exactly what took my eye first. From the moment I clapped eyes on that shapely body, I realized that there was something very familiar about it, even if at that distance, about 200 yards or so, but I couldn't work out exactly what. However, as the woman progressed up the beach in my general direction, her hand went up and pulled the matching black bathing cap from her head. The moment those flaming red curls unfurled themselves, I knew exactly who she was, but for the life of me, I couldn't understand how she had washed up on the same island, let alone beach, as I, several thousand miles from our hometown. I might not have known that she was on the island, but as she got closer, it was pretty obvious to me that she knew that I was there, and what's more, that she was making straight for me. She had to have pre-knowledge of my presence and exact location, because I'd had difficulty in recognizing her at that distance, red hair or not. There was no possible way she could have spotted me almost lying down on that lounger as I was. It never crossed my mind, of course, that she might have already spotted me before she went into the sea and had decided to make a dramatic appearance. Not that it did her any good because I pretended to be asleep behind my sunglasses. I wore mirror sunglasses so the females would not be aware of me perving their nubile bodies as they paraded about the beach and hotel patio where I lay. I'm not unattractive. But at 33 and feeling more like I was 53, I wasn't really in the running for picking up any spare, even if I was on holiday. I'd had my fill of close encounters with the female of our species by then. Two failed marriages and a failed long-term relationship was enough for me, thank you very much. I was quite happy to lie there and fantasize, thank you. Mary Beth sashayed directly up to the foot of my lounger and then stood there staring down at me, her hands on her hips. I pretended to be sound asleep. She coughed once, and then a little later she ahemmed. Nevertheless, I didn't move a muscle, concentrating my mind hard on keeping my breathing deep and regular. With luck, she'd come to think that I was in a drunken stupor and go away. Eventually, she called out my name, but when I still didn't react, then she said, Fuck you, Tony Smart. Why do you have to drink so damn much all the time? Then she turned and walked past me into the hotel. I gave her plenty of time to get out of sight before I checked that the coast was clear. Shit, I said out loud. What the fuck is she doing here? I'd first clapped eyes on Mary Beth Thomas. That's it, Mary Beth, by the way. Not Mary Elizabeth. Wow, betide anyone who ever called Mary Beth Elizabeth. Apparently, she'd been named after some American actress that her grandfather had had the hots for in his younger days. As the first female born to the family, Mary Beth was given her name. I suppose to keep the old boy happy. Anyway, I first ran into her when we were both 16 on my first day in technical college. With a lot of other students, I'd been milling around in the lecture room that was to be our base for the year, when Mary Beth made her entrance. With a delightfully shapely body and that flaming red hair, no bugger, well male student anyway, in the room could miss her. Every male eye in the place, no matter whom they were apparently talking to, was on Mary Beth as she went up to the lecturer and asked him where she should sit. The randy bugger playfully suggested the front row where he could keep a friendly eye on her. Beth chose this moment to demonstrate her loud voice and called him a dirty old man, if not with a little playful tone to her voice, and everyone took it as a joke. Her actual words were, Here, we'll have to watch this one, girls. I think he's going to be as bad as the rest of these perverts. The rest of these perverts she was talking about were her male fellow students, who, of course, were still ogling her. Mary Beth then threw a withering look at one poor guy as she passed him on her way to the rear of the class, where she very soon collected a little group of female queen worshippers around her. On one point, Mary Beth was right. She did have to watch the boys. Very soon, she was getting hit on and asked to go out on dates by nearly every reasonably-looking guy in our class, and many from other classes as well. I had to give it to her she didn't string any of the guys along. Actually, she told them to piss off in no uncertain manner and of course, always at the top of her voice. Eventually, nearly all of the guys got the message, and they stopped pestering her for dates, which I assumed had been Mary Beth's plan. 
Another odd thing about Mary Beth. Well, don't you think it was odd? A very beautiful young woman who, to all intent and purposes, kept every guy at arm's length no matter how handsome they were? Bloody odd if you ask me, I thought at the time, but I was to learn otherwise later. Anyway, after a few weeks, word was spread around by some of the young wolves in the college that Mary Beth was a lesbian. I suppose to cover the fact that they hadn't managed to score even a date with her. Anyway, the odd thing I'm talking about was her female group of friends. Unlike most catty little female groups, obviously they weren't a closed shop. Neither was there a need for any girl to particularly fit in with the leader's ideas, basically Mary Beth's, for she couldn't abide female bullying of any kind. Any mousy little girl was apparently welcomed into that little, eventually very big gang. About the only thing they all had in common was that they were all very dedicated to and vocal on the subject when it came to the women's liberation movement. But we'll gloss over that part if we may. It has no real bearing on the story. After watching Mary Beth's appearance that first day, I thought I had the situation pegged correctly and I had no intention of being made a laughing stock of by trying my luck no matter how much I fancied her on the quiet. There were plenty of other fish in the sea for me to chase after. I have always believed that there's little point in wasting time chasing the unobtainable. I suppose six months had gone by when we were assigned group projects by our physics lecturer, the group members he randomly pulled from a hat, or to be precise, a wastebasket. It was some surprise to me when I discovered Mary Beth had come over to join the group I was in. Even more surprising was the fact she had very little to say for herself that first day. It didn't strike me until later that physics was hardly Mary Beth's forte. By the third or fourth week of the project, Mary Beth was really struggling and holding the whole group back, and some of the group members actually dared to get uppity with her. Oddly, Mary Beth didn't bite back, but she looked embarrassed. Tony, you got a minute? The lecturer called out to me at the end of the session. I turned and saw him standing there with Mary Beth at his side. What's up, boss? I said, approaching his table. Mary Beth here is having problems with this project. She's asked me to remove her from your group because she's holding the rest of you back. I stood there and stared at him, wondering why he decided that I must be the natural leader of the group, which I wasn't actually. This is your area, Tony. You leave the rest of them at the stocks. Could you find your way to find time to tutor Mary Beth and bring her up to speed? I suppose so, but what does Mary think of that idea? Mary Beth is willing to give it a try, Mary replied, correcting me, not for the first or the last time, on her name. Okay, girl, I'll meet you in the refectory after classes finish, and we'll see if we can arrange something, I replied. Then I got the hell out of there before she had time to react to the girl comment. Yeah, I was pulling her chain a little, but I was a young man who liked to get out and enjoy himself. I had enough to do with my own studying. I really didn't want to waste my time tutoring one of the college dykes. Yeah, well, throw enough mud at something and eventually some of it will stick. I do believe that I was coming around to join the general consensus of opinion that Mary Beth was a lesbian. I had never seen her with a guy since the day we'd all arrived at the college and no one, well, guy anyway had ever claimed that they had taken her out. Well, we can't do much in here. Too damn noisy, I said to Mary Beth when I joined her in the refectory that afternoon. The library, she suggested. Yeah, but they get all out of shape if you talk too much in there. How about your place? Where do you live? About a mile away, but I don't think my dad will like that. He's a little paranoid about me and boys. Mary Beth, I ain't your bloody boyfriend. I'm supposed to be tutoring you in physics. Tell your father that if you don't get help, then you're going to flunk out. He'll have to come round. I'd say you could come to my place, but my brothers would be around with their tongues hanging out all the time. We just wouldn't get any peace. I'll talk to him then. Give me your number, she replied. Her dad did keep giving me funny looks, but he never actually said anything. Mary Beth's mom was great and was forever trying to feed me up. When I went round their house, usually I was invited to have an evening meal with them. Only that saying, Grace Lark, before eating, took me by surprise a little. The months rolled along and I eventually got Mary Beth up to speed, but once the project was over, she still kept hounding me for help. It seemed that I was going to be stuck with tutoring her in physics for the rest of our college lives. Not that I really minded once you got past that front she put on, she was very nice, really. For a dyke, that is. Tony, are you a queer? 
You could have knocked me over with a feather when Mary Beth asked me that, on about our third week back of our second year of college. No, I fucking well ain't, I replied angrily. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. I was just wondering because you've never made a pass at me. You're probably the only male in this whole college who hasn't made a pass at me at one time or another, and that includes half the lecturers. I don't take rejection well, Mary, and you have the reputation that you've rejected everyone who's ever asked you out. You do realize that there's some in this college who suggest that you swing the other way, don't you? Do you, she asked. Honest answer, I queried. Honest answer, I'm thick-skinned, she assured me. Well, at one time I did wonder, but I've got to know you quite well now, and I've never seen anything that leads me to believe that you swing that way. Thank you, and for your information, I don't. I was just an early developer, and I've had randy little shits thinking they are going to get into my pants ever since I was 10 years old. One or two very early and extremely upsetting experiences was enough for me to be very wary of all men, young and old alike. Holly shit, you weren't. No, I just got touched up a couple of times before I was old enough to realize what the buggers were up to. My dad kicked the living daylights out of one of our neighbors when I told him, and he warned me to be careful around the male of the species. I'm afraid it's got to become a bit of a habit. Oh, I see, I said, wondering where the conversation was going. No, you don't see, she replied. I don't, I echoed, wondering what the hell Mary Beth was referring to. No, you don't. If you did, you'd have kissed me yonks ago. Christ, I've given you every opportunity, she announced. That's news to me. Yeah, I can see it is. Well, if you aren't going to see the damn bait, I'd better take the bull by the horns, hadn't I? She said. Then she threw her arms around my neck and pulled me into a clinch, right there in the middle of the college refectory, in front of everyone. The next thing I know, Mary Beth's tongue is jammed in my mouth and cheers are going up all around us. I'll happily admit that it was possibly the best kiss of my life that far. However, I was somewhat embarrassed by the all attention we were getting from our audience. I had little choice but to wrap my arms around Mary Beth. God, did those two breasts feel good pressing against my chest? That was it, really. From that day forth, Mary Beth and I were an item. Even her old man seemed to have accepted the fact. The years rolled by, and at the age of 19, I went off to college on the South Coast to study engineering. Mary Beth, who had left the education system by then, came along with me, and we set up home in the grubbiest little one-bed, roomed flat that you've ever seen. Nevertheless, we were happy there together, for a while. Beth found a job and went out to work every day, and I, of course, went to my studies. Most evenings we worked together in a pub for the extra money. Well, that flat was such a dump. Mary Beth wouldn't want to stay in it on her own. It was as I was approaching my final exams that things kind of turned all topsy-turvy on us. I believe I'd been somewhat shocked at Mary Beth's reaction when I'd suggested that we got married right after I graduated. Mary Beth sort of panicked and mumbled something about not being ready to get married yet. After that day, we seemed to argue all the time about nothing at all. It was as if every time I opened my mouth, I was waving a red rag in front of a bull. Eventually, the night after I took my final exams, we somehow finished up going at it like hammer and tongs. I suppose a lot of things were said that really shouldn't have been, but I really can't remember what they were. Damned if I can remember what the argument even started over now. Anyway, when I got home the following evening, I still had some odds and ends to tidy up at college. Mary Beth had packed up her stuff and gone home to her mom and dad. Well, that's what the hastily written note implied. No goodbye or anything. A neighbor described what I believed was Mary Beth's father's car parked outside the flat late that morning. I can tell you I was pretty devastated when that happened, but I was extremely angry at the same time. Christ, we'd invested five years into our relationship, and Mary Beth had walked away as if it meant nothing at all. When I told my parents what had happened, they suggested that I should call Mary Beth and talk things over with her, but I was adamant that I wasn't going to do that. She'd left me. I figured that it was up to her to come and find me again. They even went as far as to tell me that Beth had called their house looking for me, but I never really believed them. I told them that I'd tried to call her back, when I hadn't really. Yeah, well, I was pretty pissed off with the turn of events, as I saw it. It was up to Mary Beth to do the bleeding groveling. I should say that I'd got used to not living at home with the horde by this time, 
and I had found myself a nice little flat before I even got back to my hometown from uni. All right, originally, I had intended that Mary Beth and I would start our married life living there together, but it served just as well as a bachelor pad, somewhere that I could take all the conquests that a free man could enjoy, if you understand me. My relationship with Mary Beth did provide one very unexpected legacy, being known as the guy who'd captured the most beautiful girl in town's heart, who incidentally had the reputation of being an ice maiden, and having kept her for five years, did somehow raise my standing amongst all the unattached females locally. All right, and maybe some who weren't unattached when I first looked their way. That didn't make me everyone's favorite guy in town either. I do believe that a few guys got a little narked with me about it, and it could well be that that came back and bit me a few years later. One will never know. Christ, I found that I really was like a kid let loose in a sweet shop, Almost any bird I looked at was more than happy to go on a date with me, and quite a few were just as eager to climb into my bed as well. It not being a very large town, I had always realized that it stood to reason that I was going to run into Mary Beth at the few good night spots we had. Although I wasn't really expecting that I'd run into her with a different guy almost every time I took a girl out. Jesus, she was a bitch. The moment she saw me, she'd maneuver her date around the dance floor until they were standing right in front of us. Then they'd prance around with his hands all over her for most of the evening, whilst Mary Beth looked daggers at my date and myself. I soon discovered an antidote for her behavior, though. Once Mary Beth and her date had positioned themselves to her satisfaction, I'd pull my date in close and snog her silly. Usually Mary Beth and her guy would be gone when I finally broke the kiss. For some reason, it got me a reputation as a good kisser as well. I think I'd been back from uni for about six months when I picked up Sally somewhere. I have no recollection of where we met. I can only assume she was one of the girls who'd always been around somewhere. Let's say I'd always known of her but didn't know her at the same time. All I can remember of that evening is giving her a lift home in my taxi one evening, snogging and most likely stealing the odd grope or two on the way. Yeah, well, I didn't care. I took quite a few liberties. If the girls didn't like it, well, there were plenty more fish in the sea. The following evening was a Friday, and just after I got in from work, I found a message on my answer machine from Sally, asking what time I was picking her up. Well, we went dancing that night, and after a lot of hemming and hawing, she deigned to come back to my flat with me for the night. What surprised me was not that she was so willing, but the fact that she was almost completely inexperienced. Oh, don't go getting the idea that Sally was a virgin or anything. She most definitely wasn't. But she admitted to me later that she'd only ever been shagged, with a capital S, in the back of a car or behind the bushes in the park. No word of a lie, missionary only, and not the slightest idea on how to give head. Boy, did I have my work cut out bringing her up to speed. Mind you, she took to making love in a bed, as against getting shagged in the back of a car, like a duck to water. To be honest, once she found those internet sites on my computer, you know the ones with all the mucky and very descriptive stories and pictures on them, she turned into a raving sex maniac. You say it, and Sally wanted to give it a try. Even bondage and S&M. Not really my cup of tea, but we had some fun experimenting. Somehow, Sally and I finished up as a couple, probably more because we had so much fun in the bedroom or any other room in the flat that took our fancy than anything else. Then suddenly, just after that Christmas, Sally dropped the bomb on me. She was pregnant. I have no idea what went wrong. We'd taken all the right precautions, but these things happen. No type of birth control except total abstention is completely foolproof. We were married less than two weeks later. Unfortunately, Sally's pregnancy did not go full term. I'm not completely sure what went wrong because the doctors spout all that technical shit at you. Anyway, Sally got some kind of an infection herself and nearly died. It was an upsetting couple of months for both of us, I can assure you. But once she recovered, and with additional precautions, we added a cap to the mix, our sex lives got back the enthusiasm they'd had when we'd first got together. The problem was that after a few months, I discovered that Sally had taken an interest through the internet in swinging. Her, or maybe it was my problem, was that she didn't seem to understand that for it to be swinging, both partners have to be in on the plan. Or should that be act? Joining a swinging club without your partner isn't really cricket now, is it? The divorce was amicable and very quick. 
I couldn't really see the point in getting all out of shape over it, especially when Sally was happy to shag my brains out, even after the divorce. Not that I did very often. I had no idea who else she was shagging. She had developed the art of giving a good blowjob by then, though. After Sally, I sort of lost confidence in women. Hey, maybe that's why I still laid Sally now and again. I knew she was a cheating slut, so I wasn't likely to be disappointed again. But then, Jane came into the picture. I met Jane at the office. To be precise, we were stuck in a lift together, in the dark, during a power failure. We sat there in the dark and talked about our lives, having no real idea what each other looked like whilst we chatted. Boy, did I get a surprise when the lights came back on. For some reason, not even the emergency light had come on when the power went out. And who the hell takes more than a quick glance at anyone else who gets into a lift with them when there's only the two of you in there? Yeah, if the lift is crowded and a shapely young backside gets in, most guys will try to position themselves to have a good perv. But when there are only the two of you in the lift together, very suddenly, the floor display panel has to take on a whole new interest, or you're liable to get your face slapped. When the lift suddenly jerks to a halt and you're plunged into complete darkness, eventually you have to start talking to your companion, to put them at their ease at least. You know we both had cigarettes, but neither of us had a working lighter. By the time the power came back on, we'd both pledged to give up the dreaded weed. We actually met again a few days later to assure each other that we'd kept that pledge. That meeting lead to a date and, well, eight months later we were walking out of the registry office man and wife. But not before Jane had informed me that children were not going to be on the cards. Jane had been born with a deformity in her ovaries, and they'd had to be removed almost the moment she reached puberty because of some complication or the other, which she never did go into fine details about. I'll be honest here, I get just a little queasy when folks start talking about all that medical stuff. Jane also informed me that she had to take hormone replacement pills every day, like some women who reach the end of their menstruation do. What do they call it? The change? Although the idea of not having any naturally born children was a blow for me, Jane had accepted her lot many years before. We did discuss the possibility of adoption sometime in the future and there were some unexpected benefits to living with a woman who didn't menstruate, no PMS like Mary Beth used to get sometimes, and no missing out a few nights every month. The only unpredictable thing was a distinct variation in Jane's sexual appetite or libido that proved to be connected to those pills she took every day. Jane, of course, had been aware of it for years, and unbeknown to me until after we had wed, she changed the dose of the pills she took to take it into account. Whether it was an overdose or underdose of one particular pill, I never could fathom out. But when she got it wrong, Christ the woman would almost kill me. Still, others have had far worse crosses to bear. Mentioning about Mary Beth again reminds me, with hindsight, I realized that a very odd thing happened concerning her. You remember, I said that when I got back from university, she seemed to be everywhere that I took a date. Well, the odd thing was that after I got married to Sally, Mary Beth disappeared off the face of the earth, only to reappear again whilst I was dating Jane. But once Jane and I got hitched, well, blow me, no more Mary Beth again. I hardly ever clapped eyes on her anywhere in town, other than in the high street sometimes on Saturdays, and even then she appeared to be avoiding eye contact with me. Not that I let it show that I cared. Working in the same building, Jane and I probably spent more time together than most newlyweds. We traveled to and from work together, and ate lunch together every day. Our free time, when we weren't trying to shag each other to death, mainly revolved around golf and line dancing. The golf was my pastime that Jane took up with much more enthusiasm than I did her line dancing, although I had to admit that it was fun once you got the hang of it. We tried other pastimes as well, 10-pin bowling, yoga, horse riding one summer, and water skiing another. The horse riding stopped when Jane got thrown. The water skiing stopped when I broke my leg, Yoga kind of came and went as our fancy took us, and the ten-pin bowling, well, we were both absolute shit at it, but we went once a month or so anyway and laughed at ourselves. For the next few years, theoretically, everything was perfect. I got promoted and we bought a nice little house. Jane changed jobs within the firm, but for a long time we couldn't seem to get to work in the same department. Then suddenly, and completely out of the blue, I was offered a position in the same department as Jane. I took it although it cost me a little seniority. Regretfully, 
Jane was at the time secretary to a guy called Jack Prout, Prouty to most people behind his back. Jack Prout had seniority over me, and he made it very clear right from my first day in the department that there was no way he was going to let me have Jane as my secretary. Not that that mattered really, because my desk, being the new guy, was in the same office as Jane's. Although we knew that as I moved up the chain, I'd get a private office like most of the other guys. Another unexpected flaw in Jane's and my master plan was that, as the new guy, Jim Martin, the department head, decided that I needed to familiarize myself with the department's clients, and that led to numerous overnight trips all over the bleeding country. Instead of spending more time together, Jane and I were apart more than we had been since almost as far back as that day we were stuck in the lift together. We had been married over four years by then, so we just sat back and bit the bullet. We knew that once I'd visited, spent some time with, and got to know all the clients, then I wouldn't be away half as much. Well, that was the state of play when I suddenly realized that everything wasn't quite as kosher as it should have been. Two snippets of overheard conversation were to tell me that some bastard was pulling my bleeding chain and I got really out of my pram over it. Alone, they meant almost nothing. Together, those snippets were to lead to the shit hitting the fan in the biggest possible way. The first I overheard by the lifts one day, I was carrying three file boxes full of paper and I stepped to one side so that the people in the lift could get out before I went in. But as the two guys exited the lift, one was saying to the other, Christ, when she gets going, nothing stops her. You know, she knife fucked four of us to death, the other... The guy suddenly stopped speaking when he saw that I was standing there. Him doing that locked his words into my brain. Then about a week or so later, I was going into the tea room one morning when I heard one of the other guys saying, Yeah, Prouty switched her bleeding pill. She was fucking gagging for it when we got... Once again, the guy stopped speaking when he realized that it was me entering the tea room and they both avoided my eyes as they hurriedly left. Now, even if Jane hadn't been like a woman possessed, when I'd returned home from my trip the previous evening, I'd have still worked out what was going on. There was only one woman who kept her handbag inside Jack Prout's office. How kind of the bugger to offer to volunteer to lock it in his safe every day, and I still wonder exactly how long the bastard had been fucking about with Jane's pills. Come to that for how long had the bastard been laying her? Consumed with anger, I charged straight from the tea room into Prouty's office where Jane was taking dictation from him. My unexpected and sudden appearance must have told him that I'd suss the bugger out because he tried to scoot his chair through the far wall, but I was on the bastard anyway. I had two hands around his neck and I was squeezing for all I was worth. No, Tony, please don't kill him, Jane begged me. Why do you love him that much? I spat back at her. No, I hate him for what he did to me, she replied. Then you knew he'd been messing about with your medication, I asked. Oh my God, you bloody arsehole. No wonder I couldn't help myself, she screamed. And then suddenly, I realized that I had to release Prouty so that I could restrain Jane. She'd swept up a bleeding great metal trophy he had on his desk, and she was about to brain the sod with it when I grabbed hold of her. She needed both hands to lift it, so I was sure that it would have crushed his skull. I don't know, me needing to protect my wife from doing something that would lead to her going to prison for a long time kind of took precedence over my need to kill the bugger myself. You bastard, my medication has to be balanced very carefully. You could have killed me, Jane had shouted at the top of her voice as we'd struggled with that trophy. I, and I doubt Jane had either, had no idea whether Prouty messing with her hormone pills could have caused her physical harm. But it turned out Jane was more annoyed about that then Prouty inviting the other guys from the office to enjoy her charms. Well, to be honest, when Jane was on one of those sexual highs, I don't really expect she cared who it was, providing he was shagging her. I learned that it had been going on almost since I'd been transferred into the department. In fact, I had been transferred into the office with the express design on getting me out of the way. What's more, the department head was one of the guys Prouty had taken around to our house. The net result was that Jane and I divorced quite quickly. I know that she hadn't been party to Prout's plan. Actually, she had always stuck so close to me because she feared what might happen if she got her dosage wrong sometime. Look, it isn't like a tap. The pills govern the hormone rate, but it takes days for variations in dosage to take effect. How Prouty found out what Jane's medication was for, we never did discover. 
We can only assume that he hunted through Jane's bags sometime and found them. Two minutes on the internet would have told him what they were and what effect they could have. Then we assume he got some stronger ones from somewhere and made the switch. I had been transferred into the department to facilitate his taking advantage of that switch. I didn't divorce Jane for what Prouty and the others had done with her. Well, not the first time Prout did it anyway. I knew she had little control once she got like that. I divorced Jane because she didn't tell me what had happened that first time. She had let him come back time and again, and even accepted him bringing the other guys along because he couldn't keep up with her. As it happened with Sally, we stayed in the house and even the same bed together right up until the divorce was final. Well, look, Jane got a new prescription and corrected her dosage straight away, but she was still on that sexual high and we both knew that it was going to take time for her to come down again. God knows who she might have dragged into bed with her. Yeah, of course we had all the STD tests done, but the cat was out of the bag by then. We'd been shagging each other silly, so there was little point in curtailing our sex life until Jane was on a more even keel. Jim Martin, the department head being involved in the debacle, really dropped the company in the shit. Jane and I cleaned up between us, so after the smoke cleared, we parted on a very sound financial footing and under good terms. You know the company even asked me to take over that bloody department? But by then, almost everybody in the firm knew the gory details, so I couldn't accept their offer. Besides that, there was hardly anyone left to run the bloody department. They all got thrown out within days. Well, everyone who had taken part in the gangbangs or even held intimate knowledge of them. The ax fell swiftly and broadly. A couple of times before the divorce was final, Jane began to ask me if we could stay together. She never did complete the question, though, so she must have been able to read my answer in my eyes. With a good few bob in the bank, no job, and with the story going around that I was the guy whose wife had been enjoying gangbangs with half guys in my office, I saw little point in staying in town. Neither did Jane. Once we'd sold the house, Jane took off up north somewhere and I headed for the airport. My intention was to see the world, kind of backpack-like, but on a bigger budget. I'm not really the cheap hotel or hostel type, too damned old. So there I was lying on a sun lounger on the patio of a hotel on an island in the South Seas and wondering what perverted twist of fate could possibly have led to Mary Beth bleeding Thomas being there was well. Although I tried to return to my usual pastime of watching the scenery wiggle by and imagining what I could teach them up in my room, I couldn't. Mary Beth kept popping up in my daydreams and putting a damper on things. After another hour or so, I gave up. Well, I worked at getting the daydreams going again for a while, but there was no possible way I could settle down and enjoy my imagination if Mary Beth was in the vicinity somewhere. The memories of our relationship kept popping up and getting in the way. I resolved that if Mary Beth was staying in the hotel, then I'd move on to Pastures New. Hey, there are plenty of islands and every one of them had just as many hotels. Okay, maybe not all as popular with the Aussie birds, but there was plenty talent and food for lecherous thoughts, staying at most of them. I must have looked very funny. I know I looked conspicuously odd as I made my way back into the hotel. Without really realizing it, I must have been creeping along, looking this way and that, hopping to spot Mary Beth before she saw me. Had I spotted her, I would have taken off in the opposite direction as fast as my legs would carry me. I do believe that I was surreptitiously hiding behind a pillar, trying to get a good look at everyone in the bar to make sure Mary Bath wasn't in there, when one of the hotel staff asked, Is something wrong? Have you lost something, Mr. Smart? No, no, everything's fine, thank you, Zach, I replied, lying my head off. If you need anything, sir, you know you only have to ask, he said, the emphasis being on the word anything. Yeah, Zach was that character. You usually find one pseudo-pimp working somewhere in most luxury hotels. Well, there is one thing, Zach. Did you happen to notice a redhead arrive, maybe in the last day or so? Nice figure, long curly red hair. I was surprised to note that I was giving Zach descriptive signals with my hands to emphasize what I was saying. Odd, really, because Zach spoke English probably better than I did. No, sir, I don't believe we've had any redheaded ladies staying here for a week or so, Zach replied. You haven't? Well, she was on the beach about an hour ago. Are you sure, sir? You know when the sun is at the right angle, it can apparently change the colors of almost anything. Not that red hair it can't. Are you sure she's not booked in? 
If you know the lady's name, we can check with the register, sir, Zack said, heading off towards the reception desk. I followed still furtively, trying to look in every direction at the same time. The lady's name, sir? Zack asked, opening the ledger on the desk and then looking at me expectantly. Thomas, Mary Beth Thomas, I replied. Zack started flipping through the pages, mumbling the name Thomas repeatedly. No, sir, we haven't had a Thomas staying here for two months now. What about Mary Beth something else? She could well have got married. Zack returned to flipping through the register this time, repeating Mary Beth over and over, under his breath. No, sir, no Mary Beth's or Mary Elizabeth's this year at all. If she's here, then the lady must be traveling under an assumed name. Don't you have to have their real names in the register? You know, like you're holding our passports? On the official paperwork, sir, but this is only a copy of the register. We have quite a few very famous people come to stay, and very often they prefer to travel incognito. This other register? I'm sorry, sir, but if she is not in this register, then she is not staying here. Zack raised his eyebrows, and I understood that I'd get no more information from him, but I still tried. Is there anywhere that you might suggest I look? I asked him. Sir, I was off yesterday, but I've been here since six o'clock this morning mainly in the lobby here. During that time, I can assure you that I have seen no red-headed ladies. I could think of no reason for Zack to lie to me. He was more the type to offer to sell me the information if he had it to sell. So the thought began creeping into my head that just maybe I had been asleep and I had dreamt that I saw Mary Beth on the beach. Thinking back, there was a marked similarity between Mary Beth's exit from the sea and Ursula Andress's sudden appearance in the Dr. No film, and Mary Beth's comment about my drinking, surely that dated back to my uni days. Feeling a little more relaxed, I made my way to my chalet, or should I describe it as a pretend little grass hut. Once there, I showered, and then, still completely nude but with a towel wrapped around my waist, I switched on my computer and wrote short emails to my parents and my brothers, attaching nice pictures of panoramic views that I'd taken on my digital camera to each. The ones to my three brothers, though, always had nubile females in skimpy bikinis tucked away in a corner somewhere. Then I switched to the BBC's site and perused the news for a long time, depressing reading most of it. I was still trawling through the news sites when Louise called from the other side of my window's bug screen. Hey, Tony, you coming down for dinner? Dan and Louise were an American couple who were staying in the next chalet along from mine. They were a few years older than me, but not many. Dan had been injured in the service of his country, but he usually got around with the aid of two walking sticks. I had noticed the wheelchair in the corner of their chalet, though. I'd made friends with them on the night of my arrival at the hotel. Well, to be honest, Louise and Dan, after giving me a good look over whilst I ate dinner alone, and yes, I had been aware that they were watching me whilst I ate, had accosted me when I entered the bar and explained that Dan could no longer dance but his lovely wife loved dancing. They asked that, as I was obviously unaccompanied, would I kindly share their table with them in the evenings and maybe dance some of the time with Louise. I can't be sure what expression I had on my face, but Dan quickly went on to say that they perfectly understood that I was probably looking for some female companionship so they would not be offended if I hooked up with someone else during the evening and we moved away from their table. I think they were quite shocked when I informed them that a companion of any type, especially a female, was the last thing in hell I was looking for and that I would be more than delighted to dance the night away with Louise any time. From what you said, I thought you might be, well, not into females, Louise said the first time we hit the dance floor for a slow number. Er, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I'm afraid that beautiful women always have that effect on me when they get up all close and personal. Anyway, I've got nothing against women in general providing they belong to somebody else and they plan to stay in that relationship, I replied. What is that supposed to imply, she asked with a grin. Louise, I'm a normal, healthy male with all the urges that most men get. I appreciate the sight of a pretty woman, but I've been burnt three times. Never again will I get involved with anyone in particular. I suppose you could call me a confirmed bachelor now. Are you telling me that a handsome young guy like you is celibate? No, I'm not actually. It's just that nowadays I prefer one-night stands and that kind of thing. 
preferably no names and definitely not leading to any long-term complications. Actually, I'm perfectly happy to spend every evening for the next two weeks dancing with a beautiful lady whose husband will be taking her back to their own room every evening. What part of heaven did you fall from, Dan and I? Often have to find dance partners for me. But all too often, some folks mistake our approach for something completely different. Surely a dance is a dance, isn't it, I said, trying to understand what Louise was saying. Let me try to put it this way. Some guys think Dan likes to watch, Lau said immediately turning a medium shade of pink. I have no idea what expression I had on my face, but it led Louise to continue. No, he doesn't. Dan would strangle any guy who tried to lay a finger on me with his bare hands. Yeah, I tried that once with the last bloke who rogered my ex-wife. Damn sight harder than you'd ever imagine. What, you tried to kill him? Tell me more? Louise asked, pushing me away a little so she could look into my eyes. Tried being the appropriate word. Whilst I was still trying to strangle the bugger, my ex-wife decided she was going to smash his brains out, so I had to release him so that I could restrain her. That statement confused Louise even more so I eventually had to tell her that story, much as I've explained it to you. I got on extremely well with Dan and Louise, and over the next few days they very skillfully extracted my whole life story from me between them. I learned about Dan getting blown up, literally, in action, and how he'd suffered since as a result. He had managed to father three children by Louise, though, so his injuries hadn't stopped him doing some things. Their children were back in the States with their grandparents while Dan and Louise took a break in the South Pacific. After that first evening, the four of us spent most of the time together, Dan and Louise laughingly giving me cover on the beach whilst I perved all the acres of flesh on view. On that particular day, I'd been alone on the beach because they'd gone on an all-day boat trip. Shit, is that the time? I haven't even started to get dressed. I called back to them. You better come in. I won't be a minute. I shouted, dashing into the bedroom to get dressed. I hope you're going all out this evening, Louise called out after they entered and poured themselves drinks. What's so special about this evening, I called back. Louise's comment had brought me to a standstill. Have I forgotten something, I was thinking? I was racking my brains. Had my new friends mentioned an anniversary or birthday that I'd forgotten about? Tony, it's Valentine's Day, Louise called back. All those pretty young ladies who've been giving you the eye all week are going to be asking you to dance with them this evening. What do you want about Louise, I called back, but it was Dan who replied. The tables are turned on us tonight, my friend, he informed me. It's the ladies who get to ask us guys to dance this evening. Then in that case, I hope that Louise can get you up for a really slow one. I really think she'd enjoy that, I chided him. I'll think about it, but only if you promise to be ready to step in when I hit the wall, he said. You can count on me, Danny boy, I replied, laughing. I had to change my shirt three times and my slacks once before Louise considered that I was up to muster. Then the three of us set out for the dining room, at Dan's pace. Dan in front, Louise holding my arm behind. As we walked, I told them about the weird dream I'd had on the beach. Louise chided me for falling asleep in the sun warning me that I could have gotten seriously burned. I wonder why you dreamt about Mary Beth with all those sexy young things around, Louise commented. Oh, leave the guy alone, Louise. You're just annoyed that he didn't dream about you, Dan called back over his shoulder. Struck me as odd as well. I haven't seen Mary Beth in, what, five, maybe six years. I suppose it must have been telling you about her the other night, I replied. Do you ever dream about her at night, she asked. I can't say that I do and I can't say that I don't. I rarely remember what I've dreamt about. I know that everyone dreams, but I'm not one for remembering them. That's a pity, Louise said. Take no notice, boy. She's annoyed that you can't remember any sexy dreams that she features in, Dan giggled from in front of us. Louise treated his remark with the disdain it deserved and mumbled something about burning the old sods walking sticks. Generally, our conversation was pretty light heart. Will you stop that, Tony? It was a dream you said so yourself, Louise scolded me during our meal. Apparently, I kept scanning the hotel dining room, trying to convince myself that Mary Beth wasn't hiding in there somewhere. Sorry I can't help it, that damn dream was so real, I replied. The more I think about it, the more real it becomes. At that, Dan got up on his sticks, 
and slowly looked around the whole dining room, even moving off a few paces so that he could see the bar area. Nope, not one redhead in the whole place. You're safe, lad, don't worry, he said with a grin after settling back into his seat. For the rest of the meal, they talked about their sea cruise on, as they put it, a big sailboat. I sat and tried not to keep glancing over my shoulder. The band was already at it when we hit the open-air lounge where all the dancing happened. After taking a quick turn around the floor with Louise to get her going, I asked the band to play a very slow number before the floor got crowded so that Louise could get Dan up on his feet. It must have looked quite funny to the uninitiated, what with myself and one of the waiters sticking quite close to them, just in case Dan took a tumble. Louise was correct. Several women who I couldn't even recall seeing before asked me to dance. What with them and Louise, I hardly sat out a single number, but Dan always kept my glass full so I could grab a quick mouthful between sets. It must have been about half ten, and Louise and I were swaying around to a slow tune when she suddenly whispered in my ear, Mary Beth, is she about five six? Yeah, in her bare feet, I replied. Nice legs when she's wearing heels, though? Definitely. Fair old pair of bazoomers she's got on her as well. Hold on, I thought to myself, just a bleeding minute. That was a statement Louise just made, not a question. Yeah, but what are you going on about Mary Beth for, Louise, I asked. Well, I don't like to worry you handsome, but I think Mary Beth just walked in off the beach. No, don't look now. She hasn't spotted you yet, but she's looking. Oh, shit, so it wasn't a dream. I wonder what she's doing here. Well, it's only my female intuition, but at the moment I'd say she's looking for you, young man. How do you want to play it? I have no idea. Perhaps I'd better run for it. Why? She's only a woman. And if you ask me, a very beautiful one, what could be the harm in you dancing with her, even if it's just once? Louise suggested. And then she went on. Whoops, too late to run now, Tony. She spotted you. I should imagine she'll be at the table the moment we get back there. Are we going back there now? The tune isn't over? Yeah, I feel suddenly very fatigued. And besides, I'm as curious as you are about why she's here. Dance with her and then bring her back to the table. I'll get Dan to pump while you dance with me again. Louise was correct. I hadn't even sat down when Mary Beth appeared at my side. May I have the honor of this dance, fine sir? Mary Beth said with a slightly sarcastic tone to her voice. Okay, Mary Beth, what are you doing here? I asked no sooner than we'd hit the floor. I'm on holiday. What else would I be doing? But why here at this particular hotel on this island? It's not what you'd call on the beaten track. Well, I ran into an old friend of mine, Amanda Mitchell. You remember her from college, don't you? Anyway, I told her that I was thinking of going on holiday somewhere really exotic, and she told me that a relative of hers was having a really great time of it here. So, well, here I am. Mary Beth, you know full well that Amanda Mitchell is now Amanda Smart. She married my brother. Damn it, you were at the bleeding wedding. Yeah, well, Amanda told me that her brother-in-law was having a really great time swanning around this very lovely South Sea Island. Oh, and I saw the pictures you've been taking, so I brought a very small bikini so that I wouldn't look out of place. But I don't understand why. I came? Yes. Because you are here stupid. I messed up once, and I've been trying to attract your damned attention ever since. When you weren't married to one of your... No, I'd better not say that. It wouldn't be fair of me. I let you get away, and what you did, and who with afterwards shouldn't really be any of my concern. But unfortunately, whether you like it or not, it always has been. Anyway, eventually I figured that I'd have to take the bull by the horns, like I did the first time. She said then, just as suddenly as she'd done it in that college refectory all those years ago, her arms were around my neck and her mouth clamped over mine. Mary Beth, I said when she finally let me come up for air. What, I know you like kissing me. You like to feel my tits pressing into your chest like that as well, don't you? My little friend down there told me. Look, Mary, you walked away from us, I ranted, but not too loudly. There were other people on the dance floor. Yeah, I know, it was a mistake that I've regretted ever since. A mistake, is that what you call it? I got the idea that you got to wondering what other guys were like in bed. After all, I was your only boyfriend and I'm not quite as thick as I look. Partly true, I'll admit, but way off the mark. Up to a point I panicked and as you said, 
You were not only the only man I had been to bed with, you were the only man I'd ever let kiss me at the time. That's a lie, you kissed all of my brothers under the mistletoe. Be serious, Tony, they are all too shit scared of you to actually snog me, but we did try to make it look good. Well, you could have fooled me. You don't have to believe me, ask your brothers or their wives. Anyway, whatever you believe, I can tell you that, up until you graduated, I'd never even so much as held another man's hand, let alone let one kiss me romantically. And after you walked out on me? Actually, you told me to get out. You might not remember correctly, but I believe you said something like, if you want to try some other guy, then get out of my life and find one. I said that? Near enough, exams or not, you were hitting the bottle a bit back then. Possibly it was only the bloody scotch that kept you going. Shit, no wonder my scores were so poor. I only just scrapped through, you know. I tried to warn you, but you wouldn't listen. But you went, even though you say I was intoxicated when I told you to go? Well, up to a point, you were right. You were the only man, except for my father, that I ever let get close to me. So I'll admit I was just a little curious. So you did want to compare me with others in bed, I said, rather loudly, and that resulted in several other dancers turning to look our way. Tony, can we take this conversation somewhere a little more private, please? Mary Beth asked. Yeah, all right, come and meet my friends and then we'll find somewhere to talk. Dan and Louise greeted Mary Beth like old friends and they fell into conversation almost immediately. Louise fending off my protestations that Mary Beth and I were going to find somewhere private to talk and insisted on relaying to Mary Beth almost everything I had told her about our relationship. When I looked at Dan, he just shrugged his shoulders, grinned, and then ordered another round of drinks. Where are you staying? I suddenly heard Louise ask Mary Beth. Some little dump along the beach? I couldn't afford these prices, Mary Beth replied. Oh, Tony's got another room in his lodge. You should move in there, I was amazed to hear Louise say. Now hold on, I said. Louise threw me a withering look. Oh, well, if he's going to be silly about it, you can move into the spare room in our lodge. You can't stay in that place. Dan and I saw it this morning. It might even be dangerous there. I'm sure they have the same security as they have here, I said, more to make it appear that I was part of the conversation than anything else. No, some of these places aren't that security conscious, my friend. It would probably be safer if Mary Beth moves into one of our lodges. They'll only be her meals to pay for. Dan threw in for good measure. Louise, shall we dance now? I said with touch of anger in my voice. Yes, thank you, Tony. That would be lovely. What are you playing at, Louise? I asked when we got out on the floor. Nothing, Tony. I'm thinking of the girl's safety. But Mary Beth and I were going outside to talk. You purposely prevented that from happening. Yes, because you were getting angry. I thought that you might say something that you'll later regret. Don't I have a right to be angry? She all but told me that she left me so that she could find out what other men were like in bed. She did nothing of the kind, Tony, I know. I was standing right behind you dancing with that Australian guy. Poor man didn't know what he was letting himself in for when I asked him to dance. Now, I'm of the opinion that you two should talk in the morning, when you are both calmer and completely sober. It's imperative that your discussion goes smoothly, Louise explained calmly. Imperative, why, I asked. Because, my handsome friend, you are in love with that woman and she's in love with you. You think? Oh, I know, I saw it in your eyes when you first told me about her, and I can see it in her eyes when she looks at you. Oh, you can, can you? So can Dan. It's not just my opinion, it's Dan's as well. Remember we watched when you started dancing together and when she kissed you? Didn't you say she took the lead the first time the pair of you kissed? Yeah, she did, but that was then and this is now. A lot of things have happened since Mary Beth and I were at college. I know that, but tell me honestly, what was the happiest time of your life? When Mary Beth and I were together, I suppose, those first few years were great, until I asked her to marry me, that is. And then, well, everything went pear-shaped. Tony, when you get back to the table, I want you to tell Mary Beth that all discussions are off until tomorrow. This evening, I want you two to behave as if you've just met. Oh, and if you feel like taking her back to your lodge and she feels inclined to come with you, 
Please, take her. Why should I do that? Tony, see that man over there? The one who can only stand with the aid of two pieces of wood. I love him. I've always loved him. I nearly lost him, but the good Lord decided to let me keep him. Mary Beth wants to get you back, and I know how she feels inside. Look, she's prepared to do almost anything to get you back, and I know that you certainly need her. Don't ask why, and don't try to come up with excuses to justify the unhappy way you've been existing. Take the love Mary's offering you and cherish it. Don't stop to ask irrelevant questions. Does what happened 10 years ago really mean anything now? Now it's about time you danced with her again, and please no talk about the past this time. You can talk about that tomorrow if you feel that's it's still relevant. I noted that Dan, who was in apparently deep conversation with Mary Beth as we approached the table, gave a little nod of his head. At first I thought it was a greeting to his wife, but then Mary Beth was on her feet. She took my hand and pulled me back out onto the dance floor. Have you ever met Dan and Louise before, I asked. No, never, but they seem to have us pretty well tapped, Mary Beth replied. What do you mean by that? Dan says that we are made for each other, something I agree with him on, by the way. Dan told me that you're head over heels in love with me, even if you don't realize it, and that I should screw your eyes out tonight, she said with a grin on her face. Oh yeah, just like that. Yeah, and Dan said that as this is Valentine's night and we ladies are supposed to, or rather are allowed to take the lead, me said that I should drag you to bed right away because tradition says that you have to bow to my wishes. He does, does he? Well, I think he might be stretching things a little, but it sure sounds like a good idea to me. What did Louise say to you? That we shouldn't talk about the past until we've slept on it, I was saying when Mary Beth cut in. Together? Well, she kind of hinted that way, I replied. I like Louise. She's my kind of woman. Mary Beth, I feel like I'm being railroaded here. You are, but I'll make you a deal. Tonight, well, what's left of it, we behave to each other just like we did when we first moved into that disgusting flat. Then tomorrow we'll talk about all the bad decisions we made. Oh, sorry, we'll leave Sally and Jane out of it. They really had nothing to do with us except get in the way. Then after we've talked everything out calmly tomorrow. If you want me to get on a plane and go home, I will. And what's more, I'll never darken your door again. I know you can treat me like one of your famous one-night stands, she added with a grin. How do you know about them? There's not much that I don't know about your life, Tony. Something unexpected happened as we were returning to the table. An Aussie woman, good looker too, asked me to dance and then her friend collared me for the next. I gathered the two of them were working their way through every guy in the place. I was feeling quite fatigued when I finally sat down. Those Australian girls were pretty energetic on the dance floor. There had been a little rearrangement of the seating while I'd been gone, so Mary Beth was then sat beside me. As the four of us talked, the conversation being carefully steered away from the subject of Beth and I, I realized that Beth had both of her arms entwined around my left arm. I have no idea how long she'd been doing it, but it was something she'd done many times in the past. Throwing caution and possibly all rational thought to the wind, I extracted my arm from her grasp and placed it around her shoulder. Mary Beth's chair screeched on the floor as she scooted it closer to mine. I know it sounds stupid considering that there was so much we really should have talked and even possibly argued about first, but at that moment, I knew that Mary Beth and I were going to be back together. Sometime during the night, I'd had to get up and relieve myself. When I returned to the bedroom, lit as it was only by moonlight, I found myself standing there gazing down at Mary Beth's beautiful and very naked body. What the hell went wrong? Why did we waste all those years? I asked myself quietly. We didn't waste them. We found out what a horrible place this world is if we haven't got each other, Mary Beth replied. And, I'll add, taking me completely by surprise. So what now, I asked her, sitting on the bed and looking into her eyes. Children would be nice, but we need to get a move on. The old biological clock is ticking, you know, she replied. Not a bad idea, three, we said, didn't we? I said, remembering our discussions when we were young. That was the plan. But if more happened to come along, I won't complain. Shall we make a start now? She giggled. I could just make the smile on her face in the moonlight. I thought we already did. No, that was just the warm-up. Now's the big event. 
she said as she dragged me down onto her. Several things jumped into my disorientated mind at the same instant as I awoke. Firstly, and I think of most importance to me at the time, was that something was tickling my nose. Secondly, I was aware there was a weight on my chest that also appeared to be pinning my right side and shoulder down on the bed. Thirdly, the light was so bright that I dared not open my eyes to see what the weight was. And fourthly, I could hear several people talking in the other room. Lifting my left arm to wipe away whatever was tickling my nose, I discovered that the offending item was Mary Beth's ginger locks. At that instant, just about everything made sense again. Mary was obviously draped over me, where she'd collapsed from exhaustion after our very energetic dawn session. No, I won't go into that because I would never finish telling you this story. Having figured out what was tickling my nose and pinning me to the bed, I turned my attention to the muffled voices I could hear. There appeared to be four people in the other room. I figured one female and three men. The female voice I deduced had to belong to Louise. I couldn't hear exactly what she was saying, but I would know the nuances of her accent anywhere. That led me to conclude that one of the male voices belonged to Dan, but I could not fathom who the other two men could possibly be. Then my thoughts were disturbed by someone tapping on the bedroom door. Almost without waiting for a reply, the door opened slightly and Louise's voice asked, Are you two still alive? Just a minute, Louise. I was about to reply when I became aware that either my movement or Louise's call had aroused Mary Beth, who called out, Come in, Louise, we're fine. I frantically tried to slide out from under Mary Beth so that I could find something to cover my embarrassment with, but Mary Beth had me well and truly pinned down. Actually, she prevented me from speaking by locking her mouth over mine for a few seconds. When she finally allowed me to breathe and move again, I made a grab for the bed sheet to cover myself with. Jesus, Mary Beth, I'm naked, I blurted when I saw Louise standing at the foot of the bed grinning down at me. Oh, don't worry about me, Tony. You ain't got anything I haven't seen before. Louise replied, apparently glorying in my embarrassment. I don't know, though, she went on. With tackle like that, you could get a job as a male exotic dancer. I've been wondering what it looked like ever since I felt it against my stomach the first time we danced together. I apologize for that, Louise, I spluttered in my embarrassment. Oh, don't worry about it, Tony. I told you at the time I took it as a compliment. Anyway, if you two have finished trying to destroy that bed, your breakfast is out here. Dan and I had it sent over. You do realize that it's nearly lunchtime. Is it? Oh my, we sort of got carried away, Mary Beth replied. Um, I'd better have a shower and I'll have to look through Tony's stuff to find something to wear. No, you won't. Your bags are out here. Dan and I had them brought over from the other place this morning. Dan settled your bill there. Um, I think I said to prove that I was still there, I believe. Don't fret, Tony. We realize that you two have a lot to talk about today. But if push does come to shove, Mary Beth can use the spare room in our lodge. That just ain't going to happen, Louise, I replied decisively. Thank you, darling, Mary Beth said, and then she tried to smother me again. Shower, children, Louise said in a commanding tone, and you better take them one at a time or this breakfast will be stone cold before you get near it. Besides, Dan and I can't sit out here all day, she added as she closed the door. Mary Beth released me, then jumped up and headed for the shower room. I tried to follow, but she pushed me again, asking me, please bring my suitcases in, which I did after wrapping myself in the bedsheet again. Louise giggled, and Dan, who had made himself at home and was sitting there drinking coffee, just made the statement, heavy night, lad. You could say that, I replied whilst attempting to pick up two suitcases and hold the sheet around me at the same time. I'm not sure that I was completely successful in the latter, because as I went back into the bedroom, I heard Louise comment to Dan, told you, impressive. Dan chuckled and then said something to her that I couldn't quite make out. You're more than enough for me, lover, Louise replied and giggled again. For some reason that I couldn't understand at first, Mary Beth chose to wear that little black bikini again. I noted Dan cast a couple of admiring glances her way as we ate, and I noticed Louise dig him in the ribs with her elbow. To which he replied, What, we're here to appreciate the scenery, aren't we? Which led to both Louise and Beth giggling again. As Mary Beth and I finished eating, Louise produced a notepad from somewhere and appeared to switch into what I can only describe as efficient secretary mode. 
She reminded me so much of how my secretary used to look when I arrived in the office in the mornings and she was about to reel off what I had on for the day. Right while you two were, er, appreciating the sunrise this morning, I was making a few notes, Louise informed us. God, could you hear us? Mary Beth asked. I should imagine the whole damned island heard you. Dan grinned back. Don't exaggerate, Dan. They weren't making that much noise. Louise chastised him and then went on. Anyway, Mary Beth, Tony and I have talked a lot over the last few days, and I've learned that there are certain things that have been playing on his mind over the years. I'm not sure that Tony really understood what was going on, but I believe I do, especially since I met you. So I thought that maybe it would be a good idea if we went through them one at a time and got them out into the open, you know, clear the air a bit so there aren't any skeletons in the cupboard. Hang on, girl, this is Mary Beth and Tony's... Quiet, please, Dan. Mother knows best, Louise interrupted him. I bloody hope so, Dan mumbled. Right first, Mary Beth. When you turned down Tony's proposal of marriage, he got the impression that you wanted to try other men in bed. Louise, Dan interrupted. Dan, please be quiet or go take a walk or something. She chastised him again. True and not true at the same time, Mary Beth replied without flinching. However, she did slip her arm around me and squeeze my waist. Several things were happening at the same time. Tony was struggling with his course. He'd started drinking a little too much. Well, I thought anyway. And without telling me, he'd rented a flat in our hometown. I had trouble understanding why he hadn't told me about it. My friend had labeled it a bachelor flat, and maybe I read more than I should have into that. You knew about the flat? I asked in surprise. Stephanie Carter worked in the one of the estate agents you wrote to Tony. You didn't rent the flat through them, but Steph heard that you'd signed a lease with another firm. Oh, I replied. Then after being together for God knows how long, Tony suddenly asked me if I wanted to marry him. You know I'd never thought about when we'd get married. I'd just been blissfully going along enjoying each day as it came. Suddenly, and without any warning, Tony asked me to marry him. I'm afraid I panicked a little and really didn't know what to say. I should have said yes right away, but instead I sort of waffled around and said nothing coherent, really. To be honest, I can't recall exactly what I said, but it must have been something about Tony being the only man I'd really got to know. Anyway, Tony must have misunderstood, and he got it into his head that, well, you know, don't you? To put it bluntly, Tony got it into his head that I wanted to sleep with other men before I said yes, so that I could see how he measured up, which was completely untrue, because the idea had never crossed my mind. He made me feel good, and as far as I was concerned, that's all that counted. I'm afraid to say that when he accused me of wanting to try other men in bed, I was hurt, and I got angry, very angry. Remember that at this time, I knew about the bachelor flat, and he'd said nothing to me about it. Anyway, in my anger, I got to thinking that actually I'd never even kissed another man, romantically, that is. We had plenty of male friends, and I got on pretty well with most of them. But before Tony, any boy who tried to chat me up got short shrift. So up to a point, I did wonder what it would be like to go out on a date with someone other than Tony. We argued about it for weeks, although I should have realized that Tony was on edge because his final exams were coming up. But the more we argued, the more I wondered what I had missed. Consequently, when at three in the morning he came into our bedroom, he'd been drinking nearly all night and demanded that I either put up that is set a date for the wedding or get out of his life. Well, I blew my top. Tony slept in the lounge, I think, and had gone to back to the college before I woke the next day. I called my father intending to cry on his shoulder over the phone, and the next thing I know, my parents had driven down, and we are packing my stuff in the car. You know I didn't even wait to find out how Tony had got on with his exam. My parents took me home and I cried for the next couple of weeks. Daddy said that if Tony really wanted me, then he'd show up and claim me, but he didn't. Eventually, I called his mother and she told me Tony was living in a flat in town somewhere. She couldn't even tell me his address. I asked her to please get Tony to call me, but he didn't do that either. The next thing I know, some of my friends are reporting back to me that Tony is out dating local girl, girls who I had thought were my friends. So I said, well, two can play at that game. And, well, there were a whole string of guys who'd asked me out in the past. So I had the word put out that I was ready to date. My plan was simple. It was a small town with not many good places to go. 
I'd show up with some guy in tow and remind Tony what he was missing. The trouble was he wasn't missing me, he was too wrapped up in the silly tarts he was dating. What about you trying other guys, Louise asked. Hell no, I never found one who I even liked, let alone could kiss as good as Tony. Well, you know, they never gave me that tingly feeling when they kissed me. I promise you, none got to what the boys refer to as first base even. Although some took the odd liberty when we were on the dance floor that I let them get away with up to a point. Tony was supposed to get all jealous and come racing over and sort them out. Well, that was my plan, but of course the silly bugger never did. Charming, I dropped in. Well, you didn't. Those guys had their hands all over what was rightfully yours and all you did was turn away and kiss some little tart. Calm down, children. I believe that you were both playing silly games when you should have been talking to each other. Louise chastised us. You're so right, Louise, but for an early developer physically, I believe I was a rather late developer in other respects, if you understand me, Mary Beth explained. Sounds to me like you were as well, Tony, Dan commented. Now don't go getting all uppity on me and taking offense, but, well, shit, man. Didn't anyone tell you that you have to hang in there and fight for your woman? I'll consider myself suitably chastised, Dan, but at the time I misread the signals, I replied. Ah, now, they were getting into a different ballgame completely. Understanding what's going on inside the female mind is damn near impossible for any guy most of the time. You just have to be there when they need you and take all the crap at other times. What's that supposed to mean? Louise shot back at him. That I love you, sweetheart. Sometimes I don't understand you or why you bother to put up with and stay with a worn-out old wreck like me, but I love you no matter how cranky you get. Dan said, throwing a sly wink my way. I saw that, Dan. Are you aren't making fun of me again, are you? A wicked grin came over Dan's face and he winked at me. Then he showed me a little trick that I've made use of many times since. He pulled Louise into his arms and kissed her on the mouth. A minute or so later, after she stopped struggling, he broke the kiss. But because Louise started to continue scolding him, he silenced her again with a kiss. This they repeated for about ten minutes, until finally Louise lay quietly in his arms when he broke their kiss. Dan looked across at Mary Beth and me. The best part about arguing with the wife is the making up bit. Now I'm sorry, but Louise and I need to take this somewhere a little more private. Mind she's going to have to help me up first, he added with that grin again. The bed's made up in the other room. Saves you walking so far, I grinned at him. Thanks, Tony. I think we'll take you up on that offer, Dan replied. But my list, Louise said. Ah, bugger the list, Louise. We've got more important things to do. Besides, look at them. They can't keep their hands off each other. Whatever problems they did have are ancient history now. Suddenly, I realized that Mary Beth was tugging me to my feet. What's up, I asked. You fed your belly and you've had plenty of time to recover. Now it's baby-making time again. She grinned down at me. Epilogue. Damn near wore me out, Mary Beth did during the rest of that holiday. Although she didn't get pregnant, that was to take another few months. Although I don't think Dan and Louise were planning on any more children, from the email we received a couple of weeks after we got back to the UK, we learned that three of them must have flown back to the States. Louise was actually showing when she played the part of Mary Beth's maid of honor. Mary Beth had a job to go back to in the UK, but I didn't. I had a good few bob in the bank, of course. That had effectively been hush money from Jane and my employers. It had looked like enough for a single man to bum around the world in style for the rest of his life. But buying a nice house and settling down to raise children with Mary Beth called for me to earn a living again. For a while, there I thought I would never find a job. There's a distinct drawback to having taken an employer to the cleaners, even if it didn't get into court. Rumors get around and as other employers, in theory, have no idea why your last employers suddenly almost emptied their bank account into yours. They are a little reluctant to put you on their books. The job problem was unexpectedly resolved for me when, scrapping the bottom of the barrel, I approached one of my former employer's clients. He told me that he farmed out work in my field and pointed out that the company he had been using had gone right down the pan for some inexplicable reason. He suggested that the door was open for any new concern that anyone might decide to set up. I took the hint and became self-employed. 
Now I've got quite a nice little operation going with our own offices in town. Mary Beth didn't fall pregnant until a couple of months after we were married. I believe I might have told you that already. Anyway, she then proceeded to drop another one every 18 months or so, until we decided that four was enough. Mary Beth was 40 by then anyway. We are still in close contact with Louise and Dan. They come over every so often to visit. We plan on taking the children over to the States to visit them next year. We think our youngest is just about old enough to appreciate the trip. Sally and Jane? Well, Jane had to leave town in the end. I had never said anything in public, but you know how the rumor mill works. At least one of those guys must have talked, and she had every randy little shit within 50 miles chasing her around. I have no idea whether Sally is still hooked up with her swinging crowd, but if she is, I assume her new husband is a swinger as well. That's about it, I think. Life goes on.